<laughs> All right, our next speaker is, is definitely one of the highlights of today's, today's program. Um, Eliza McNitt uh, is a writer and director, and she's making, been making VR projects for a while, and her one, the one that's up the back here, Spheres, uh, did a seven figure deal. It was at Sundance. It's been to pretty much every single film festival in the world. She must be extremely exhausted from all that flying. Uh, let's get straight into it. Where is Eliza? She's right here. <laughs> Eliza McNitt. Hi. All right. Please welcome Eliza. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, and I snuck up there. One thing, you know, <laughs> Eliza also does a really great Australian accent. Oh, no. What city are you from? From Melbourne. <laughs> That's pretty it's terrible. It's terrible. <laughs> Thank you so much. And if to say something is legitimate, you say... Oh, I forget. Fendinkum. Fendinkum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You there could be Prime go. Minister. Everyone, Eliza McNitt. <laughs> oh, God. I, I hope my virtual reality is better than my Australian accent. Um, hello, everyone. I am Eliza McNitt, and I am the creator of Spheres. Um, I'm really honored to join you today here in Sydney and tell you the story of the journey that we have been on for the past year that, yes, has involved a lot of travel and also a lot of coffee, but it's an honor to be here today in Sydney. Uh, so let's begin. No human on this planet has ever fallen inside of the heart of a black hole until now. This is Spheres. Both in life on Earth and the birth of black holes from the violent death of supermassive stars, order appears out of chaos. Space is not silent. It's actually full of sounds. For thousands of years, we've looked to the stars to find our place in the universe. But for the first time, we listen to its music. Spheres is a three-chapter virtual reality journey to uncover the hidden songs of the cosmos. Executive produced by Darren Aronofsky and Ari Handel, and starring Millie Bobby Brown, Jessica Chastain, and Patti Smith as the voice of the universe, Spheres transports you to worlds beyond our own. I'm Eliza McNitt, and I'm the writer and director of Spheres. In high school, I was a two-time Intel Science Fair winner for my research on the vanishing of honeybees around the world. And my award was to visit the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland at CERN. It was inside of the particle accelerator where they smash together atoms to uncover these deep mysteries of the universe. That I, be I love that. <laughs> That's exactly what happens. Um, <laughs> I began to wonder, you know, what, ha what lies beyond this world that we live on? So it was in this moment that I really discovered the emotional power of science as storytelling. So my very first virtual reality experience, or really it was this experiment, it was called Fistful of Stars. And it was a journey inside of the Orion Nebula, where you got to experience the birth, life, and death of stars. And um, I got to explore the beauty of, in the life cycle of stars, which was deeply fascinating, and I also, uncovered that the death of a star is sometimes the beginning of its life. And so um, here is this experience, Fistful of Stars. It was performed with a live space opera for 6,000 people who all did virtual reality at once. And this was this insane, um, ex insane experiment. We didn't know if it was going to work. And um, we really went for it and um, had, you know, this is what it looks like when 6,000 people do VR together. And um, what was really beautiful was that for that brief moment, we were all lost together, floating through the stars. So we actually premiered the VR experience um, in the Positron chair at South by Southwest in 2017. And it was really cool to hear some other filmmakers earlier talking about South by and the exposure it got them because I would say South by was definitely a really pivotal point for me where I got to meet so many people in this incredible community and take a further step into virtual reality. So. Um, Fistful of Stars was about everything in the universe that we can see with our eyes. 
which led me to wonder what happens when we listen. Oop, there we go. <laughs> so, following the very fateful US election, I felt as if the world around me was falling apart. But one of the greatest scientific achievements of our time shifted my focus beyond our Earth to the darkest edges of the cosmos. One billion years ago, two black holes collided, creating a gravitational wave, which is a ripple in the fabric of space-time. In 2015, this signal reached our planet. So I just want to reiterate that this took one billion years for it to reach our planet. And for the first time ever, we actually heard it right here on Earth. And first predicted by Einstein, this discovery forever changed science. It was then that I discovered this ancient theory, and it was called the music of the spheres. And it's an ancient philosophical concept that long ago predicted that the movement of celestial bodies created a form of music. But for the very first time, we actually could use scientific data to detect these signals on Earth. And instead of looking at the cosmos, now we could listen to them. Spheres illustrates this Nobel Prize winning discovery of gravitational waves, as well as uh, investigates many other sounds in the universe. You navigate the universe using cutting edge virtual uh, visual effects and immersive VR technology. And through the violence of the universe, we hear the cosmos sing. Developing this experience is very similar to the chaos of the scientific process. And when I was, um, so when I was 17 years old, when I was researching the vanishing of honeybees around the world, I followed the scientific method in order to craft my experiment. So, you know, in science, first you make an observation, you form a hypothesis, you conduct an experiment, you analyze the data, and you form a conclusion. I mean, it's essentially the same process that you go through when you're writing a screenplay or coming up with an idea. And so in order to communicate my findings with my science project, I had to tell a story. And one that, was wo one that really wove data into a narrative. But it had to be presented to the judges uh, with emotion and heart, and it had to feel very human. And by creating this process where I'm searching for the answers, mistakes can become breakthroughs in understanding. And for me, and I think for many people out there, um, science and art really blur together, and they become one. And like in science, there is a real adventure involved in the creation of an idea and the stories that I discover along the way. Now I'm going to um, bring you inside of the series to look at the development of each of the chapters. So we'll begin with chapter one, which is called Chorus of the Cosmos. So um, in the process of making spheres and just being generally very fascinated in the universe, by the way, this is about to turn into like a full science lesson, so I hope we're ready. <laughs> um, so I discovered that the universe is actually full of sounds. And uh, you know, from planets to stars to black holes, all of these celestial bodies really did make music. So first I'm gonna explain what I mean when I talk about this. Collisions of charged particles release what's called electromagnetic energy, which are waves that can travel through space. So what you see in this image um, are auroras. And so the electromagnetic energy in auroras are actually visible to our eyes. But this is only a small fragment of the energy that surrounds us. Invisible to us, the universe is actually full of so many other waves, few that can be seen with our eyes, and the rest must be found with our machines, like telescopes, radio, infrared, ultraviolet, x-rays, and gamma rays. Because humans can't actually travel to the stars themselves, 
we rely on these waves, which are moving through space, to bring the cosmos down to us so that we can now experience what's out there. And um, as I discovered with the Hubble telescope in my very first VR experience, our eyes can actually only show us so much because we are beings of many senses, not just what we can see. And we transform these waves into ones that we can see, but also we turn them into sounds that we can hear. I heard this song, and um, this is a song called Chorus. And this is the call of our planet. So according to NASA, this song is a product of very low frequency radios generated by lightning strikes or excited electrons zipping through what's called the Van Allen belts to this is uh, NASA's description of it. There are two vast swaths of radiation that are surrounding Earth. But what I found really beautiful about this idea that you can actually literally listen to the song of planet Earth is that we were not alone. And there were many other planets that called back to us. So um, here's the call of Jupiter. So this is the sound of the spacecraft Juno listening to Jupiter's auroras. And also just a really fun fact that I love, this um, storm here on Jupiter has been raging for 300 years. And now this is the call of Saturn's rings. And I think this for me was also very much a creative launching point because I was so enchanted by how bizarre this is. <laughs> So in the creative process of um, making this experience, what was really exciting, because I was working with all of these real sounds that can be found on NASA's website, um, this was really one of the launching points that I would give to um, our sound designer and to our composers. And I do want to talk for a moment just about how integral sound and music was to this experience because it really is about developing this sound of the cosmos. And, um, you know, I was very honored to get to work with uh, Craig Hennigan, who is um, been working with my mentor and executive producer, Darren Aronofsky, since the very beginning. And, um, you know, he was he really crafted the soundscape for the experience. And then um, we were also very honored to have the opportunity to work with the composers of Stranger Things, Kyle Dixon and Michael Stein. And um, I was very drawn to the sound of um, those very spooky sounds from Stranger Things. And I thought they would be a great fit for this project. And um, in doing this piece, you know, I would give them a lot of material like what I just played to you. And I would ask them to just kind of, you know, take that as inspiration and use that to craft these voices of each of the planets. And so for us, the science was the creative inspiration behind this project. So what you see here is our depiction of what's called a magnetosphere. And almost all planets, except for Mercury and Mars, has this magnetosphere, which is an invisible field that surrounds our planet. And when particles of solar wind strike the magnetosphere, it creates these waves that we can translate into sounds. So in this opening episode, really what I wanted to um, uncover was making the invisible visible. And that's why virtual reality is so marvelous and so full of wonder and so addictive is that you're able to bring these invisible worlds to life. The goal of this experience is to explore the intersection of science and art with a story that can only be told in interactive virtual reality. We don't just see the cosmos, we actually become it. So 
now um, I'm going to take you into our second chapter, which is called Songs of Space Time. So as I mentioned before, the wonder of visualizing the invisible also comes with many great challenges. And uh, you know, these are worlds that we cannot see. And no human has ever ventured inside of a black hole, except for maybe Matthew McConaughey in Interstellar. Um, but in this experience, we wanted to capture what it was like to really fall inside of a black hole. But also, we wanted to be very scientifically accurate about it as well. And um, something I really want to get into like the nitty gritty with you about is uh, one of these effects, which um, is called gravitational lensing. And when you saw the image earlier of the black holes colliding, and you saw a bit of how the visual of it was bending, it's really hard to do that in a real time game engine. And um, this is, so gravitational lensing is an effect where black holes actually bend starlight. And, you know, it's very difficult to achieve that in a game engine on a budget <laughs> with, you know, a certain amount of time. So the team of artists that I collaborate with at Nova Lab, which is a um, VFX studio based in Paris, uh, which is led by Clément Chériot, they really cracked open a solution to create this illusion of gravity bending the universe. And I bring this up because capturing moments like these strange distortions in the fabric of space-time are really central to our experience. And in developing this piece, um, my executive producers, uh, Darren Arnosky and Ari Handel, and the team over at Protozoa, they were constantly pushing us to make this, you know, very, um, very true to the science and to um, poetically interpret the science behind this series. So my fear of black holes is what dared me to venture inside. These are subjects of our nightmares, maybe some of our dreams, but past the boundary of darkness that we cannot pierce through with our eyes, await strange things. In Sphere's Songs of Space Time, we send you on a journey inside of a black hole to realms where the laws of space and time no longer apply. Virtual reality is the only way to truly make you feel as if you're plunging into a black hole. You slip over the edge with no promise of return. When I began this project, my um, executive producer, Darren, asked me, you know, what is the hero's journey in this experience? And my immediate response was, well, there is none. It's a VR experience. How could there be a hero's journey? This is, you know, a different medium. It, it calls for a different language and a different storytelling device. But I actually realized that I was wrong about that entirely. There is a hero, and that character is you. In this experience, you're not just an observer. You are the protagonist. We take you on a journey where you must fall into the darkness in order to find the light. You're not just immersed in someone else's story, but you are the center of the narrative. So this was a really interesting challenge to now have to weave that element into every piece of the storytelling. So um, what I'm now going to do is take you through the anatomy of the scenes in this um, episode. Each element of interaction is really woven into this hero's journey, where you play the main character. So interactivity, which was a central aspect of this experience, advances the narrative. As you begin, you have what's called six degrees of freedom, where you can move around freely and explore. So in the beginning of this episode, you are observing the birth of this baby star, and you're able to really, you know, you can move around it, you can duck down, you can look above, you, you can move in every direction. That was really important to me to start off this episode, because then what happens is you step into the skin of a star. 
and I'm going to just show you a clip from the experience itself. This clip is a, um, you know, it's a real-time capture of the experience that's done through my left eye in the headset. So you'll be seeing, you know, when I have controllers and the movements that I do in the experience. So what you're seeing here is that as the user, you are out here, you're able to move around fully. And then uh, Jessica Chastain beckons you to step inside and you take your touch controllers and you look inside and suddenly you step into the heart of this star. But something further happens when you step inside of its heart, you're suddenly constricted and you lose your power to freely roam. And what this does is it assigns you your first character that you inhabit. And um, what I really love about this part is as you wave your arms, you begin to impact time. And what you're doing and what you're mimicking is the life cycle of a star. So as you're moving your arms around, you're actually creating more energy to um, replicate the uh, burning of nuclear fuel inside of the core of a star. So as you do that, um, you actually speed up the timing that it takes for the star to implode and supernova. So you then begin to impact the narrative. So next what happens is uh, this creates a tear in space-time, which is known as a black hole, and you become a new star as you're sucked inside of the heart of a black hole. This groundbreaking advancement in science really opened a new window of discovery to the cosmos, and that's exactly what we wanted to capture with this VR experience. So at this moment in the experience, what I find so deeply disturbing and fascinating about black holes is that uh, gravity trumps time and nothing can escape a black hole not even light and as you hear jessica chastain say each minute that you spend in a black hole's gravity a thousand years passes on earth so as you're being stretched inside of the heart of the black hole you're experiencing how gravity is trumping time so now we fall inside and so we've never actually seen inside of a black hole. When you go to NASA's website, there are no photos that exist of the inside of a black hole. So working alongside scientists and artists, we had to define the look of a black hole in a way that was scientifically accurate. We consulted astrophysicists at Columbia University and the Museum of Natural History in New York City while designing this experience. And these experts advised me that, you know, science is only one part of the story, but it also must be artistic and emotional. After all, the interior of a black hole will never be seen. It can only be imagined for now. Um, so at, our protagonist is the black hole, and at this point, you become the thing that will destroy you. And what I really loved about this uh, project and working with these scientists, they gave me these incredible explanations of, you know, when you're falling into a black hole, the star, it's going to start out being blue because, you know, it's a little bit hotter. And then as it cools down, it'll become red. And um, then it'll enter this point called the singularity. But then after, you know, hours of them telling me about this, they basically just said, you know what, just make it strange. <laughs> and so strange, we, we made it. Um, so at this moment in the experience, we discover the singularity. And um, this is a point where space and time no longer exist. And you get to float down into that space. And for a brief moment in time, ceased, cease to become nothingness. So eventually in the experience, you finally become space-time, which this is a, by the way, definition I found on Wikipedia. The concepts of space-time is that time and three-dimensional space regarded as fused in a four-dimensional continuum. So basically, you become a part of the fabric of the universe in the conclusion of this experience. And at this moment, you actually um, embody time and you become a gravitational wave. So um, by using your voice, you actually leave your imprint on the fabric of the universe as you become a conductor orchestrating the cosmos. 
So this was the very first chapter that we debuted and it premiered at the Sundance Film Festival this past year. And um, as Maria has told you already, something really unbelievable happened. And um, this was sort of an unprecedented thing. So on the journey of this experience, um, something very unexpected took place where Sears was the first VR experience to sell at Sundance in what they called a record-breaking deal. Um, and we're very excited to define how interactive media will be created and distributed in the future. And I'm actually very proud to announce that Spheres was also officially released on the Oculus Store on Tuesday. So you can download it at home now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you so much. But yeah, so this, um, and also, you know, stay tuned for some very exciting uh, other updates about how we'll be distributing the project, but it, it's all beginning on the Oculus Store. We actually brought the whole entire series this past summer to the Venice Film Festival, and um, this is the installation that we had that was designed by Griffin Frazen. Everyone was able to come and watch all three of the episodes, which was really um, amazing to finally have them all there. And um, we were also the very first project ever to screen at the Telluride Film Festival. And um, why that was so exciting was because we were able to showcase spheres in environments where virtual reality has never been before. And that's a really important part of this conversation to show that, you know, this isn't a tech showcase. This is a, you know, this is cinematic storytelling and it's a um, evolution of um, storytelling and um, especially, you know, in a very cinematic style. And so that was what was so wonderful about being there at that film festival. And um, as Maria also mentioned earlier, we were really honored to receive the um, prize for the best virtual reality experience at the Venice Film Festival. So that was um, <laughs> really amazing. Thank you. <laughs> so now I'm going to take you through the final episode, which is called Pale Blue Dot. And in the final episode, we trace the history of sound in the universe in search of the strangest song of all. And um, this episode stars Patti Smith as the voice of the cosmos. I just want to speak to why I chose uh, to work with three different women. I wanted to have, you know, a teenager, an adult, and um, Patti Smith, who's obviously the mother of the universe, uh, <laughs> to represent this project because um, growing up, I was always uh, listening to um, the voices of Neil deGrasse Tyson and Carl Sagan and Stephen Hawking teaching me about science. But um, I really wanted these voices to be three women who represented very different generations to pass on this story of science through an entirely new and innovative medium. So um, this is our installation at the Tribeca Film Festival. And um, this was actually also designed by Griffin Frazen. And um, it was a pale blue dot that you got to step inside of to experience uh, spheres. And you also had to take off your shoes because it was completely white, which I don't recommend <laughs> to have a white floor at a film festival. So this is the Big Bang. And uh, it is the beginning of time as we know it. In the words of Stephen Hawking, all the evidence seems to indicate that the universe has not existed forever, but that it had a beginning about 15 billion years ago. And this is probably the most remarkable discovery of modern cosmology. So it's also really fascinating to note that sound, even though the Big Bang happens, sound doesn't form in the universe until 400,000 years later. So with this chapter, I wanted to go inside of that discovery of um, the development of sound and where it leads us. So one of the most fascinating sounds is the beginning of the universe. The oldest light in the universe is called the cosmic microwave background. And um, these are the earliest whispers of the universe. These waves leave imprints on matter and light on the afterglow of the Big Bang. But in this journey, there was one sound in particular that I was the most interested in. The sound of humanity is um, one of the loudest sounds that exists to our ears. 
Uh, Stephen Hawking has predicted that humans may only have 100 years left on this planet. If we continue on our destructive path forward, humanity risks losing this fragile earth that is slipping out of our fingertips. Through this series, I want to take you to the deepest corners of the cosmos in order to look back at our planet blue. In spheres, the universe is experienced very differently, depending on who or what you are in the story. As a star, you could live for millions or even billions of years. As a black hole, your force seems to overcome time entirely where it actually no longer exists. But we bring you back to stare at our Earth, to realize that what humans experience in the grand scheme of the universe is just the blink of an eye. However, what we discover along the way is that humans are the observers of the universe. In the 15 billion years of the universe as we know it, humans have only been here for a mere 200,000 years. But I think humans do have a purpose here, because without us, who would listen to the music of the spheres? Thank you. <laughs> okay.